Hi, I'm Fabio Basile. I'm a CG artist and in this video I will illustrate my low-poly modeling process, building a simple vehicle to be used as a gaming asset. To get me started, I typically use a pre-built template with real-world measurements of the vehicle I want to build. The template is made of two components. The measurement framework identifies all meaningful part of the vehicle. In this case, the four wheels with turning range, the position and size of the engine and gasoline tank, or battery in case of an electric vehicle, the glass house, which limits the proportional size and dimension of the windows and windshield, and of course, the overall total dimensions of the vehicle from back to front and from top to the bottom edge of the frame. The visual reference is a photographic reference or a sketch or drawing of the vehicle to keep in the background while I model it to ensure visual accuracy. This might seem overkill with all these lines shooting off everywhere, however the ability to turn on and off layers in Maya or in any other software where this type of template can be recreated ensures that no matter the complexity of the project, I will still have all my tools available to get straight into the modeling part without a lot of prep work. For this modeling session, I have picked a vehicle that is very familiar to me, a very similar model to my Ford Edge SUV. As a template, I have converted a vehicle wrap design template from the bed wrap in an array of transparent PNGs. This kind of template is great for 3D modeling because of the true-to-life accuracy of the measurements. These templates are commonly used in the vinyl wrap advertising industry to wrap all sorts of vehicles and this kind of work is usually done by dividing every major panel of the vehicle, like doors, trunk, hood, roof, and so forth. And each panel is used to split very complex artwork that will then be applied on the real thing. Ergo, these templates have to be extremely accurate. The other way to accomplish a fairly realistic result is to actually take photographs of the vehicle I want to model take accurate measurements of every side of it and create a visual template in Photoshop which can be quite laborious. This is why I usually keep a cache of templates of common vehicles to be able to set up most projects as quickly as possible. Every vehicle is different and may require a slightly different mental approach. Thankfully, manufacturers tend to replicate certain features and proportions throughout their line of vehicles to deliver a consistent look and feel. With this information in mind, access to measurements in addition to the visual reference makes my task a lot easier. The way I'm going to tackle the task ahead is by taking into consideration what I can see of this vehicle. Vehicles are aerodynamic, so every line tends to look back around with very few brakes to reduce air resistance. This is also why vehicles are usually designed with NURBS and Bezier curves rather than with polygonal modeling. A good comparison will be, let's say, the Ford design team using sheets of folded cardboard to create a life-size model of a new vehicle instead of the more commonly used clay. By this token, 
this model will most likely not be as accurate as it could be if created in software like Rhino 3D or AutoCAD. However, there is a level of accuracy that can be achieved using this method with acceptable results outside of engineering and manufacturing applications. One thing I like to do is define the overall shape of every part of my vehicle. For this demo, I won't be building an interior, which will take way too long. So the parts that I will be concerned myself with for now are the body, the four side doors, the rear hatch, the hood, and the undercarriage. Focusing on separate components will also help me to control the pulley count and add further details down the line.
Now that my model is complete, you may notice that I've left out some details. This is because I'm going to fill in those details in Substance Painter, and if needed, I will also use tessellation and displacement to increase the amount of detail of this model at render time, rather than tasking my hardware resources ahead of time. Now, if I did my job correctly, Substance Painter, Substance Source, and the right set of brushes will be all I need to turn this mesh into a realistic model, ready to be rendered using any number of engines, from Redshift to V-Ray to Unreal, Unity, and so forth. I always start from the body with a good base material. I typically steer clear of using a ready-made car paint style PBR template because Depending on the rendering engine I'll ultimately use, effects like iridescence, flakes, and subsurface scattering are usually something I handle within the relevant application. While I do like advanced effects in Painter or other programs, I'm just used to a more efficient, cost-effective workflow where I get to reuse the same or similar template. The other reason for it is that I like to set up my templates with consistent naming conventions for my materials. This is extremely important if you're using scripting to automate the import of models into your software of choice using Mel, Vex, Ruby, or what have you. Keeping a consistent naming conventions is especially useful so that your technical director or technical artist won't have to waste too much time writing more code than it is necessary to accomplish a task that will otherwise be a lot simpler.
So I believe I am now about five or six hours into this project. And since this is just a demo, I should be at a good enough point to render it and take a look at the results. A good way to test your model for imperfections is to use a GPU render capable of casting an HDRI dome light to simulate realistic lighting, which typically makes anything that is slightly off about my model really obvious. In this instance, I'm using Redshift 3D, which is a very fast GPU accelerated engine with a rather powerful real-time rendering feature that allows me to test my scene quickly without having to re-render every time I move my camera. Now, because of the polygon count constraint and time constraint, a few details may leave the final result to be desired, which is pretty common with models designed for real-time applications like games or other types of simulations, where light effects, motion blur, and predetermined camera position allow for a bit more flexibility on how detailed the model is. So here's the end result. I hope you have enjoyed the video and see you next time.